Department of Transportation's How to Measure Curb Ramps training video. The State of Alaska Department of Transportation is required by our federally approved ADA transition plan to keep an inventory of all newly constructed and existing curb ramps statewide. In this video, you will learn the State of Alaska Department of Transportation's procedure for measuring perpendicular, parallel, and directional curb ramps. This transition plan is a living document meant to outline how the State of Alaska DOT will identify, prioritize, and ensure all pedestrian facilities statewide are meeting federal guidelines. This link will take you to the most recent state transition plan. For further clarification, you can contact your Department of Transportation ADA Compliance Officer in the Civil Rights Office. The current federal standards for ADA compliance is ADAG 2010. A copy of ADAG 2010 can be found at www.ada.gov. Where ADAG is unclear or incomplete, PROWAG, the proposed right-of-way guidelines, can be supplemented. A copy of PROWAG can be found at www.access-board.gov. ADAG is the current guideline and must be followed. PROWAG is the current proposed guideline and is not yet federally adopted. Therefore, PROWAG does not have to be followed. However, best practice is to design for PROWAG. It is Alaska DOT's policy to design for PROWAG whenever possible. You will need a 24-inch smart level, a small broom, a tape measure, and an appropriate blank statewide approved ramp recording form. It is very important that you make sure you are using the most recent recording form. These forms must be used for any and all data. Master copies of these forms may be found at www.dot.state.ak.us backslash cvlrts backslash ada.shtml. Before you begin to collect data, ensure your smart level is properly calibrated and set to the right mode. The process will be shown is for a Stabila smart level. Calibration of most smart levels is the same. However, if you are not using a Stabila level, you must contact the manufacturer and follow the manufacturer's instructions on how to calibrate your level. Begin by making sure your level is set to percentage. In one of the corners, you should see a percent symbol. If you do not, press the mode button until you do. Next, calibrate the level. Calibrate your Stabila Smart Level by placing the level on a flat surface and lifting either side of the level until the bubble is centered between the two lines. Once the bubble is as centered as possible, press the calibration button marked on the level. The level will beep. CAL will appear on the information screen. Press the button a second time and the level will beep again. Be sure the level remains still. When the level beeps a third time, ready appears on the screen. Your level is calibrated. Once you have heard the third beep, you will need to flip the level and perform these same steps again. Once the process is completed, your level is calibrated. If you bump the level or it vibrates during the calibration process, you will have to power the level off, power the level back on, and start the process again. Calibration should be performed if the level is dropped, drastic temperature change, or any other time the manufacturer specifies. See the level specifications for more details. It is absolutely vital that your level is properly calibrated because a tenth of a percentage can make a significant difference. The first thing that should be done is the inspector must identify what type of ramp is to be evaluated. Parallel ramps are generally classified by having the running slope of the ramp parallel to the direction of pedestrian travel. For a parallel ramp, typically all users must traverse the ramp and the landing, whether they are using the curb ramp to cross the street or continue along the sidewalk. Perpendicular ramps are classified by having a landing at the top of the ramp that users can traverse and continue on without using the ramp. They also have two flares. 
A directional curb ramp usually has a ramp that is both parallel and perpendicular to the flow of traffic and can also be described as a parallel ramp with only one ramp or a perpendicular curb ramp without flares. Identifying which type of ramp you are inspecting is very important. It will allow you to choose the appropriate form for collecting data. In some cases, the ramps you are looking at may be similar to two or even all three types of ramps. In these cases, you will have to default to your best judgment. Once you have identified the curb ramp type, you are ready to begin measurements. For all curb ramps, you must begin the same way. First, identify the main street you are on and record this on your data sheet. Next, identify the street that intersects the main street you are evaluating. This is your cross street. Next, record the station offset. This will usually be taken from the project plans. At this point, the inspector must identify which direction is north. Indicate on your data sheet which direction is north and circle the location of the ramp on the diagram in the upper right hand corner. Next, locate the landing. This is a flat resting area. On a perpendicular curb ramp, it is usually found at the top of the ramp. Begin by taking the cross slope. The cross slope is defined as the slope perpendicular to the path of travel. The path of travel will be the direction of the ramp. So the cross slope will be perpendicular to the direction of the ramp. Both PROWAG and ADAG agree that the cross slope for a landing can be no greater than 2%. Clear the ground of any debris with your broom. Measure the cross slope. This should be done approximately in the middle of the landing and record the reading in row A of the data sheet. Next, take the landing's running slope. The running slope is always perpendicular to the cross slope. Take the level and rotate it 90 degrees. Both PROWAG and ADAG agree that the running slope for a landing can be no greater than 2%. Record the running slope in row B of the data sheet. From here, move to the ramp. The ramp should adjoin the landing. Like the landing, start by measuring the cross slope. Again, the cross slope is perpendicular to the direction of travel. In this case, the direction perpendicular to the ramp's direction. Both PROWAG and ADAG agree that the cross slope from a ramp can be no greater than 2%. Clear the ground where you intend to measure the ramp. Again, this should be done approximately in the middle of the ramp. Measure and record the cross slope and record in row C of the data sheet. Also, like the landing, take the running slope exactly 90 degrees from the cross slope. Both ADAG and PROWAG agree that the ramp's running slope must not exceed 8.33%. Record the running slope in row D of the data sheet. Follow the ramp to the bottom and measure the counter slope. The counter slope is defined as the slope counter to the ramp slope at the base of the ramp. ADAG and PROWAG agree that a counter slope should not exceed 5%. As a counter slope may fall in the vehicular right away, Exercise extreme caution while doing this. Face the opposite direction of the flow of traffic. Wait until there is no immediate oncoming traffic. When it is safe, clear the counter slope of all debris, place the level, and record the counter slope in row E of the data sheet. Turn so your back is to the road. The flare to your left is defined as the left flare and the flare to the right is the right flare. It is important to note that, as per the diagram, right and left are relative to facing the landing. Move to the left flare and take the slope of the flare along the same direction as the ramp cross slope, as close to the curb as safety will allow. Be sure to make a clear spot to set the level before taking your measurement. Both ADAG and PROWAG agree that the flare slope should not exceed 10%. Record the left flare slope in row F of the data sheet. Move to the right flare and perform the same procedure only this time record the measurement in row G of the data sheet. Finally, return to the landing. Measure the width of the landing. This should be taken in the same direction as the cross slope. ADAG says that the minimum width of the landing and ramp is 36 inches. As a compliant ramp should be attached to the landing, ramp width should be the same as the landing's width. Measure from expansion line to expansion line and record this value in row H of the data sheet. Immediately perpendicular to the width, take the length of the landing. This should be done in the same direction as the running slope. 
ADAC requires that a landing have a minimum of 36 by 36 inch of level surface. Level meaning slopes in all directions less than 2%. Record the length of the landing in row I of the data sheet. Now that all measurements have been taken, it is time to answer a few questions. Is the curb ramp constructed of stable, firm, or slip resistant materials? Firm is classified as a surface that resists deformation. When you step on the material, does your foot leave an imprint in the material? Stable means, does the material resist movement? When you step on it, does it move? Slip resistant is defined as finishes that prevent or minimize slipperiness under the conditions likely to be found on the surface. The simplest way to look at this question is, will the surface become slippery when wet? If all these conditions are satisfied, mark yes. If any of the conditions are not met, mark no. Are all of the surfaces in transitions of the curb ramp flush? This question applies to the landing to the ramp, the ramp to the gutter, and the gutter to the road. Mark yes or no. Are ramps, landings, and gutter lines draining properly? This may be difficult to recognize immediately. You will need to identify the changes in elevation and use your best judgment what the water path will be. Pay special attention to where the water may pull and if it will obstruct pedestrian passage, particularly people with disabilities. Again, mark yes or no. If drainage grates are located within the pedestrian access route, does the grate prohibit passage of a sphere greater than 0.5 inches in diameter? Are elongated openings placed so the long dimension is perpendicular to the dominant direction of travel? This question is a bit more complex and multifaceted. First, if the ramp does not have a grating that is in the walkway, you may mark NA and move on. However, if there is a grating in the walkway, a few things must be checked. First, the opening in the grating cannot exceed half an inch. Second, the longest side of the opening must be perpendicular to the path of travel, i.e. the same direction as the cross slope. If all these parameters are satisfied, mark yes. If any or all are not met, mark no. Does a 24 inch detectable warning tile strip extend the full width of the ramp opening and are the truncated domes oriented to the dominant direction of travel? This question is also multifaceted. First, the tactile warning must be at least 24 inches wide in the direction of the walkway or the same direction as the running slope. Next, the tactile warning must extend the width of the ramp. Lastly, PROAC states that the truncated domes must be oriented perpendicular to the grade break. To clarify, a person in a wheelchair should be able to orient the wheels of their chair between domes along the path of travel. Confirm the criteria has been met and mark the appropriate circle next to question 5. If marked crosswalks are used, is a 48 inch by 48 inch clear space provided at the lower landing wholly inside the marked crosswalk? Caution should be exercised while attempting to answer this question as the lower landing is going to actually be in the traffic right away. In most cases, visual inspection might allow you to sufficiently answer this question as oftentimes the areas will be vastly larger than 48 by 48. Additionally, if the intersection has no marked crosswalk, the not applicable circle can be marked and you can move on. However, if there is any question as to the area of the lower landing and whether it is sufficiently inside the crosswalk, measurements will need to be taken. Begin by waiting until the lower landing is clear of traffic and measure the width of the clear space. This is typically the width of the crosswalk. As always, measure width perpendicular to the direction of travel. Next, make sure again there is no oncoming traffic once you are certain this area is clear and will remain clear of traffic. Begin extending your tape into the intersection along the path of travel. Extend the tape until you are just past the 48 inch marker. Using the front of the curb as a point of reference, be sure you have 48 inches of clear landing space inside the crosswalk. Once you have determined whether or not the conditions have been met, mark the appropriate answer. Does the curb ramp comply with ADA standards? If no, check the reasons below. Explain why the ramp didn't meet compliance and how the ramp has been improved from the pre-construction condition. The State of Alaska Department of Transportation's ADA Transition Plan states that our objective is 100% compliance. 
Unfortunately, it is possible under the current ADA guidelines, the ramp cannot be built to 100% compliance. If this is the case, it is our goal to build it as compliant as possible. If all the fields filled in are within the acceptable ranges, mark yes and move on. If any of the numbers are outside of the acceptable range, the ramp either was not built correctly or an explanation must be provided as to why the ramp was not built to full compliance. This may occur for several different reasons such as topography, structure, utilities, and other. If the ramp is built on a hill, the topography may make it impossible to cost-effectively, realistically, meet the slope requirements for ramp and landing. In another situation, a structure may limit the area allowed for the curb ramp. Therefore, the width requirements for the curb ramp may not be possible to meet because the structure would have to be moved or demolished. Additionally, a utility may be located in a way that also imposes restrictions and would be unrealistic to move for a number of reasons. In all these situations and many others, if we have built the ramp as compliant as reasonably possible, the ramp can be considered compliant if we can provide adequate documentation that every reasonable measure was taken. If the ramp is not compliant because of any of these limitations, check the box related to the limitation and provide a clear and brief explanation as to how and why it does not meet requirements. Additionally, state what modifications were made to the curb ramp's pre-construction state to bring the curb ramp as close to ADA standards as logistics would allow. Check the box stating, I certify this curb ramp was built in the substantial conformance to the plans and specifications. It is important to note that by checking this box, you are signing off that the ramp is compliant or as compliant as the situation can possibly allow. It is very important that if this ramp is not built to compliance only because of an acceptable reason, that reason is clearly explained in the appropriate field. If the curb ramp is not built to standard and a reason cannot be provided, this box should not be checked and appropriate parties must be informed. The issue needs to be addressed. Finally, print your name clearly and record the date using the format shown on the data sheet. This concludes inspection of this ramp. Parallel curb ramps are measured in a way very similar to perpendicular curb ramps. The primary difference is you have an additional ramp and no flares. Identify the main street you are on and record. Identify the cross street and record. Record the station offset. Notate the direction of north on your data sheet and circle the ramp location. Begin with your back to traffic and identify the left ramp and right ramp. Move to the left ramp and take the running slope, making sure to clear the ground first of any debris. Like the perpendicular ramp, the running slope is also along the path of travel and ADAC and PROWAG limit is 8.33%. Record the slope in box A. The cross slope is always perpendicular to the running slope and the maximum cross slope in both ADAC and PROWAG is 2%. Measure and record the cross slope and record in row B of the data sheet. Move down the ramp to the landing. Measure the landing running slope and the landing cross slope. Again, be sure to clear any debris. The parallel landing, running, and cross slopes may be difficult to distinguish. To simplify, it is best to use the arrows on the data sheet diagram. Record the appropriate slope in box C and the perpendicular slope in box D. Move to the right ramp and perform the same procedure as the left ramp, recording the running slope in box E and the cross slope in box F. Move back to the landing where the gutter meets the road and measure the cross slope. As previously mentioned, the counter slope may fall in the vehicular right away. Exercise extreme caution while taking this measurement. Face the opposite direction of the flow of traffic and wait until there is no immediate oncoming traffic. When it is safe, clear the counter slope area of all debris, place the level, and record the counter slope in box G. It is the state of Alaska DOT's policy to supplement PROWAG as the ADA standard when ADAG is unclear or silent.
As ADAG is silent on the specifications of parallel curb ramps, PROAC states that the minimum width of a parallel ramps landing is 60 inches. Measure the shortest distance between the left and right ramp and record this measurement in box H. The width of the ramp should be the same as the length of the landing. Take the measurement perpendicular to the landing's width. As PROAC has been supplemented, unlike the perpendicular ramp, the minimum ramp width must be 48 inches. Record this measurement in box I. Record your answers to questions 1 through 7 exactly as you would for a perpendicular curb ramp. Once again, check the box stating, I certify this curb ramp was built in the substantial conformance to the plans and specifications only if the curb ramp is compliant or a clear and acceptable reason for it not being built in compliance is provided. Finally, print your name and date. This concludes inspection of this ramp. For a directional curb ramp, the method is the same as for perpendicular and parallel ramps. Begin by locating the landing. Measure the running slope recording in box A and the cross slope recording in box B exactly as you have for the parallel and perpendicular ramps. Next, move to the ramp and record the running slope and the cross slope in box C and D, respectively. From here, the process for evaluating a directional ramp deviates from its parallel and perpendicular cousins, and it is important that special attention is paid to the different distinctive characteristics. The directional ramp has a tactile warning that extends the width of the ramp and is in the direction of the cross slope. First, confirm the tactile warning is 24 inches wide and the truncated domes are oriented for the predominant direction of travel. Mark the appropriate answer to question 5. In this case, the clear space for the curb ramp is considered to be the area immediately after the tactile warning. Confirm this area is at least 48 inches by 48 inches and answer question 6. As the ramp width, the clear space width, and the landing width should all be the same while taking the width of the clear space, record the measurement in box H. It is important to note that if they are not all the same, you will need to take the width of whatever one is shortest. Because the clear space is not in the vehicular right away, you will need to take the running and cross slopes of this area. Cross slope and running slopes are taken in the same way and the same directions as they were taken for the ramps and the landing. Since the clear space is considered walkway, the running slope may not exceed 5%. Record the clear space running slope in box E1. As always, a cross slope may not exceed 2%. Record the cross slope in box F. Next, the gutter counter slope needs to be measured and recorded in box G. The counter slope is measured in the exact same manner as the parallel and perpendicular ramps. As always, use extreme caution when approaching traffic. Record the counter slope in box G. Another type of directional ramp you may encounter has a tactile warning that will curve around the end of the ramp where the ramp meets the road. In all cases, confirm the tactile warning is at least 24 inches wide and the tactile warning extends the width of the ramp. In the case of a curb tactile warning, the tactile warning may not extend the width of the ramp as shown in the associated diagram. PROAG allows for this discontinuity as long as the top corner or the corner adjoining the ramp extends the width of the ramp. Finally, ensure that the truncated domes are oriented so that the gaps between are parallel to the path of travel. Mark the appropriate answer to question 5. When you have a curved tactile warning, the clear space at the base of the ramp is going to be located inside the intersection. As with perpendicular and parallel, the 48 by 48 inch area may be evaluated visually. However, if there is any question as to whether there is a 48 by 48 inch clear space wholly inside the crosswalk, measurements must be taken and special attention paid to oncoming traffic when taking measurements. As in previous instances, the width of the ramp, the width of the landing, and the width of the clear space should all be the same and recorded in box H. If there is no crosswalk, NA may be marked. In this case, the area between the ramp and the tactile warning is treated like a landing, where both the cross slope and the running slopes cannot exceed 2%. 
Measure your running and cross slopes as usual and record them in boxes E2 and F respectively. Next, measure the counter slope. The gutter in this instance will be found where the tactile warning ends. Proceed with caution and record in box G. From here, the process is the same for both a horizontal and curved tactile warning. Measure from the ramp to the furthest distance to the gutter and record the measurement in box J. Be sure you are aware of traffic as you approach the road. If you have a horizontal tactile warning, measurement J must be less than or equal to 5 feet. If the tactile warning is curved, measurement J must be greater than 5 feet. Based on this information and your measurement taken, answer question 8. Return to the top of the ramp and measure the length. The length is always in the direction of the running slope. Record this measurement in box I. If there is a constraint at the back of the landing, such as a curb or utility, measurement I must be greater than or equal to 60 inches. If there is no constraint, the standard 48 inches is acceptable. From here, answer question 7. Proceed to answering question 9 as done previously, making sure that if no is filled in, a clear and approved explanation is provided as to why the ramp does not meet requirements. Certify the data on the sheet, print name, and date. This concludes the basic procedure for properly measuring curb ramps under the State of Alaska Department of Transportation ADA Transition Plan. The examples shown are best case scenarios, but that may not always be the case. Best judgment will need to be used to adapt this procedure to your particular situation. For further clarification, you may contact your State of Alaska Department of Transportation ADA Compliance Officer and the Civil Rights Office at 907-269-0852 or call toll-free 1-800-770-6236. You may also email dot.ada.alaska.gov. Also, guidance can be found in the State of Alaska ADA Transition Plan. ADAG guidelines can be found at www.ada.gov. ProWeb guidelines can be found at www.access-board.gov. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. We hope that it will help us all achieve our goal of 100% ADA compliance.